Chapter Twenty Two of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter Twenty Two. Britain and Germany under the Flavians. Dacian War. Section 1. Agricola in Britain. Under the Flavian emperors, no important addition was made to the Roman Empire, such as had been made under Claudius by the conquest of Britain. But in two quarters the boundaries were pushed forward. The eastern boundary of Upper Germany advanced considerably into trans Rhenane territory, and the province of Britain was enlarged by a further advance northward. The legatus of Britain, Petronius Turpilianus, 62 to 64 A.D., had been succeeded by Trebellius Maximus, 64 to 69 A.D., and Vettius Bolanus, 69 to 70 A.D. These governors seem to have contented themselves with administering the province as they found it, without attempting to enlarge it. Bolanus seems to have founded forts against the natives. His successor, Petilius Cerealis, who had commanded the Ninth Legion when it was nearly exterminated in the great revolt of the Iceni, and who had recently distinguished himself by the suppression of the rebellion of Civilis, was not satisfied with the inaction of his predecessors. He made war upon the Brigantes, the most powerful of all the British tribes, whose name was sometimes used as synonymous with Britons. The Fourteenth Legion, which had been sent from Britain to his assistance in Germany, did not return to its old station but Vespasian sent him second adjectrix in its place. After many battles with the Brigantes, whose territory extended from the Solway to the Wash, Cerealis reduced part of their land under Roman sway, including the town of Lindum, Lincoln, where he established the second adjectrix. This legion was removed to Pannonia at the beginning of the Domitian's reign, but some tombstones found at Lincoln show that its station was there during the few intervening years. Thus, the result of the war of Cerealis was that the northern boundary line of the province was no longer drawn from Glavum to Camelodunum, with an advance post at Deva in the west, but from Deva to Lindum. But south of this frontier, the western highlands, Wales, could not yet be considered part of the province. The subjugation of the tribes in this quarter devolved upon the two successors of Cerealis, Sextus Julius Frontinus, whose name is well known as an authority on the art of war, and who was capable of applying his theory, reduced the Silores in the south, while his successor, Gnaeus Julius Agricola, 78 to 85 A.D., conquered the Ordovices and occupied the island of Mona, which Suetonius Paulinus had been compelled to abandon in the first year of his governorship. In the conquest of Mona he was, like Paulinus, assisted by the skill of the Batavians in swimming. Agricola, whom Vespasian thus called to be governor of Britain, had already, like Cerealis, served his time in that country in subordinate posts. He had served under Suetonius Paulinus as military tribune, and again under Vettius Bolanus as legatus of the 20th legion. On this occasion, 70 A.D., he had the difficult task of restoring discipline among the troops, who had been demoralized by a quarrel between his predecessor Rosius Callius and the governor Trebellius Maximus. He had then been appointed legatus pro praetore of Aquitania, had been recalled to Rome to fill the consulship, and then sent to succeed Frontinus in Britain. A governor of Britain might engage in one or both of two enterprises at this period. He might devote his attention either to intensive conquest, that is, the civilization and consolidation of the province as he found it, or to extensive conquest, that is, to carrying its boundaries further north by conquering new tribes. Agricola professed to do both, but really sacrificed the intensive conquest to the extensive. The confidence which the emperors reposed in him was shown by the unusually long period during which he was suffered to remain in his command. The second year, 79 A.D., of Agricola's legateship was spent in completing the reduction of the recently conquered tribes, probably in Wales, by building forts and making roads through woods and marshes. During the winter the troops remained in their quarters, and Agricola occupied himself with the Romanization of the natives. In the third summer, 80 A.D., he advanced against new tribes in the north, laying the land waste as far as an estuary called Tanaus. 
it has been thought that this unknown name may represent the North Tyne at Dunbar. The Britons did not attempt to oppose the legions, and they had time to establish some castella, in which they remained during the winter. The following summer, 81 A.D., was spent in completing the occupation of the land which had been traversed, and the army advanced as far as the estuaries of Clota and Bodotria, the Clyde and the Forth. The narrow strip of land between these friths was fortified and occupied by garrisons, and it seemed as if the enemy, who retreated into the northern highlands, had been removed to another island. In this expedition Agricola had probably about thirty thousand men with him, counting both legions and auxiliaries, and his operations were supported by a fleet, perhaps, on the east coast. At this time, the Britannic legions were reduced to three by the recall of the second Adjutrix, whose removal left Lindum without a garrison. A new station, more northerly than Lindum, was probably established. It seems certain that Agricola did not venture to push so far into the unknown regions of the north without securing the territory north of the Humber, and we may take it for granted that he occupied Eberacum, the chief town of the Brigantes, the modern York. This position took the place of Lindum, and was perhaps garrisoned by the Ninth Legion. In later times Eberacum became the chief center in Britain. In the next year Agricola sailed across the estuary of Clota to the western districts of Caledonia, probably Arran and Cantir. He had conceived the project of conquering Hibernia, which he thought might be best approached from this point. The conquest, he imagined, could be easily accomplished with one legion and a small number of auxiliaries, and he held that it would prove important to the complete subjection and pacification of Britain, for Hibernia occupied much the same relation to Britain as Britain itself occupied to Gaul. One of the chief reasons for occupying Britain was that as long as the Gauls saw a free land beyond the Channel, a land into which they could themselves flee for refuge, they were restless under Roman rule. In the same way, the sight of free Hibernia had a disturbing effect on the spirits of enslaved Britannia. In addition to these considerations, a false geographical notion recommended the policy of including Hibernia in the empire. It was supposed that Hibernia lay between Britain and Spain, and thus formed a natural connection between the western provinces of the empire. But Agricola could not carry out his project without additional forces. The three legions in Britain were little enough for the security of the province, extended as it was by his new acquisitions. He applied to Domitian for another legion, but the request was refused, and the enterprising governor was obliged to abandon his project. Domitian acted in accordance with the cautious precept of Augustus, not to undertake new conquests, and the project was never revived. Hibernia never became part of the empire. But if Agricola was not permitted to attack the island of the Scots, he was resolved to carry his arms into Caledonia. In his sixth year, 83 A.D., in spite of the dissuasions of his officers, he penetrated into the land north of the estuary of Bodotria, aided by his fleet. The appearance of the Romans excited consternation and fury among the Caledonian folk. Agricola had divided his army into three divisions, and one of them, consisting of the Ninth Legion, which was especially weak, suffered serious losses from a night attack of the native tribes. The quick arrival of Agricola and other divisions of the army prevented a disastrous defeat, and the affair resulted in a Roman victory. The Caledonians, under the chief Calgacus, utilized the ensuing winter in organizing a great army to resist the invaders in the following season. In 84 A.D. Agricola took the field again, and a great battle was fought at an unknown place called the Grampian Hill. Agricola's army probably numbered from twenty-five to thirty thousand men. He placed his eight thousand auxiliary foot in the center, and three thousand horse on the wings. The legions were arranged in the rear, in front of the rampart of their camp. The enemy, who far outnumbered the Romans, had drawn up part of their forces on the plain, the rest on the hill behind. The best plan for the Britons was to use their advantage in numbers by attacking the Romans in front and on the flanks at the same time, and this was now the movement which Agricola most feared. But Calgacus did not adopt that strategy at the beginning of the battle. In close quarters the Britons, with their long clumsy swords and short shields, were no match for the long pilum and short sword of the Romans. The Batavian and Tungrian cohorts beat the enemy back, and matters were not mended by the intervention of the war chariots, which could not move freely on the uneven ground and amid the dense ranks of the Caledonians. The cavalry of the enemy were also routed. 
The Britons who were stationed on the hills behind had hitherto taken no part in the fighting, but when they saw their companions worsted, they began to descend from the heights and make a movement to approach the Romans in the rear. Agricola had foreseen this, and detached four allies or horse, which he retained in reserve to meet them. The Britons, coming up in disorder, were scattered, and their plan was turned against themselves, for the Roman cavalry rode on to attack the rear of the enemy's line. This decided the battle. It is said that ten thousand Caledonians fell, and only three hundred sixty Romans. The year was too far advanced to undertake further operations. Agricola led his army into the maritime district of the Boresti, an unknown people, where he received hostages and gave directions to the prefect of the fleet to circumnavigate Britain. This undertaking was successfully accomplished, and Roman ports sang of the captured Orkneys. Agricola retired into winter quarters, probably to Eberacum. No Roman army ever again penetrated as far north as he. In the following year, 85 A.D., Agricola was recalled. He received the triumphal ornaments and a laureate statue in recognition of what he had done, but this did not compensate him for the disappointment of not being able to complete the northern conquests which he had begun. Yet he had really no reason to complain of the decision of Domitian. He had been allowed to remain in his post far longer than any previous legatus, and to carry on expensive campaigns. Financial considerations alone may have been sufficient to influence Domitian in discontinuing the policy of aggression in Britain. The results of Agricola were certainly not an adequate return for the enormous cost. It must especially be remembered that at the moment of Agricola's recall, a most serious war was breaking out on the Danube against the formidable kingdom of the Dacians. We can readily believe that the cost of supporting two wars simultaneously in Britain and on the Danube was quite beyond the means of the fiscus at the time. The enemies of Domitian, of course, set down Agricola's recall to the petty jealousy of the emperor. Agricola himself naturally felt sore about it. But the best justification of Domitian is that his two successors, Nerva and Trajan, abode by his decision and did not attempt to renew the designs of Agricola. The case of Agricola recalled by Domitian closely resembled that of Germanicus recalled by Tiberius. In both cases the ambition of a general was sacrificed to the prudent policy of the imperator, who saw that the outlay was not repaid by the result. In both cases the imperator was said by his adversaries to be actuated only by jealousy of a possible rival. Agricola has often received a higher place than rightly belongs to him in the history of Britain, because he was fortunate enough to have a brilliant historian for his son-in-law. Tacitus married Agricola's daughter and wrote his biography. This work, concerning the life and character of Julius Agricola, gives an artistic but superficial account of Britain, and a brief description of Agricola's campaigns, culminating in the battle of Mons Grapius, which is described at length. The author's neglect of almost all topographical details, which did not interest him, but would interest us very deeply, detracts greatly from the historical value of the book. Tacitus says that from Agricola's countenance you would readily believe him good, you would gladly believe him great. This epigram suggests the truth. Agricola was in no sense a great man, but he was an officer of respectable ability, and ambitious enough to grasp at glory when the chances were offered to him. His son-in-law and his contemporaries overrated what he had done. Ill-advised friends at Rome doubtless sounded his praises too loudly, and Domitian was not sorry when the time came to remove him from Britain. He refused the offer of a proconsulate of Asia or Africa, and lived in retirement until his death, which occurred a few years later. Some maliciously whispered that he was taken off by poison. The conquests he had made were only transient. The country he had occupied was immediately abandoned, and after all his warfare he left to his successor nearly the same northern boundary line which had been established by Cerealis, from Deva to Lindum. Perhaps the chief part of Agricola's work that survived was the occupation of Eberacum, which now formed an advanced post in the east, somewhat as Deva in the west, before the conquest of Cerealis. Eberacum now stood to Lindum in somewhat the relation in which Deva then stood to Glavum. But Agricola's contemporaries could not appreciate the importance of Eberacum, and Tacitus passes it over in silence. Section 2. The Lemus Germanicus. As there were some Germans on the left bank of the Rhine, so there were some Gauls on the right. 
the valley of the river Nicer, Neckar, had been cleared of the Germans who had possessed it, and the Romans had permitted poor and adventurous Gauls to cross the Rhine and take possession of the lands where they were constantly exposed to the incursions of the neighboring German tribes. These Gauls paid a tithe of the produce of their fields, and hence the whole district was called the Tithe Lands, Agri Decumani, or Decumates, but they were exempt from other burdens, and no Roman garrison was quartered in the land, which thus was loosely included in the empire, but was neither a province nor part of a province. The Flavian emperors placed this doubtful territory on a clearer footing. Vespasian built roads in it, and it was probably he who protected it by an elaborate system of fortification. The eastern frontier was marked by a rampart of earth, and a ditch in front of it, constructed just as in a Roman camp. Behind the rampart were placed castella at nine or ten miles' distance from one another. Between the castella occur watch-towers. This line of defense stretched from Seiopum, Miltenburg, on the Mernus, in a due southward direction to the neighborhood of Loriacum, Loch. It can still be traced, and the sites of many of the castella have been identified. Behind this there was a second system of defense. From Vindenissa, the chief camp of Upper Germany, a road led northward to a place on the Neisser which is now called Rottweil. This place was selected to be a center for the trans territory, in the same sense in which Lugodunum and Camelodunum were centers in Gaul and Britain. Here altars were set up for the worship of the Flavian house, and the place was called Aere Flaviae. From here northwards a number of castella were constructed along the course of the river Neisser, which was in itself a defense. As soon as the Neisser turns westward to join the Rhine, the line of forts leaves the river and continues in a northerly direction, passing over the Odenwald and reaching the Mernus at a point near the modern Wurt, northwest of Seiopum. This second line, connecting the Mernus and the Neisser, is known as the necker mümling line, because it cuts the valley of the Mümling stream. It is impossible to determine how much of this defensive system is due to Vespasian and how much to his son Domitian. The forts connected with this line from Loriacum to Seiopum may be due to Domitian's successors. The object of these defenses was probably not so much military as to give the people settled habits and prevent nomads entering the empire at will. But if the main credit for the enclosure of the Agri Decumatis is due to Vespasian, the occupation of the Taunus district north of the Main was probably the work of Domitian. This land was inhabited by the Matiazzi, a tribe of the Cati, who gave their name to the Aque Matiazzi, the springs of Wiesbaden. Drusus had tried to establish the Roman power in this region by founding the fort Arianum on Mount Taunus, and Germanicus had restored it. Since his time, desultory hostilities had continued with the Cati, and at length Domitian determined to take the decisive step of annexing the territory of Mount Taunus to the province of Upper Germany, and continuing the line of defense between Mernus and Neisser, so as to connect the Mernus and the Rhine. His campaign against the Cati in 83 A.D., which was so ridiculed by his enemies, was connected with his important undertaking. He was assisted by the skill of Sextus Frontinus, whom we have already met as governor of Britain. From Wirt to Hanau, the course of the mine is northerly, and at Grosskrotzenberg, near Hanau, the earthen rampart of Domitian begins. It does not follow a straight course, but takes advantage of the nature of the ground. Crossing the Lahn near Ems, it reaches the Rhine at Rheinbrohl, opposite the stream which formed the boundary between the provinces of Lower and Upper Germany. Forts occurred at intervals close to the rampart, and were connected by a military road. Near most of these castella have been found the remains of villas, with bath arrangements, meant for the use of officers. Thus the limes of Upper Germany was an earthen wall, reaching from that point on the Rhine which marks the northern extremity of the province all the way to Loriacum, except where, between the points of Grosskrotzenburg and Miltenburg, the Mernus takes its place. It was protected all the way by castella and watch-towers, and between the Mernus and Neisser was covered in the rear by a line of forts not connected by a rampart, reaching from the Mernus to Aere Flavier on the Neisser. It is thought probable that Domitian also built the first great permanent bridge over the Rhine at Moguntiacum. 
The Limes Germanicus is only part of the gigantic scheme of defense, of a line reaching from the mouth of the Rhine to the mouth of the Danube. These two rivers formed a natural defense, which merely required the erection of forts on their banks. But where the line left the rivers, an artificial defense, a wall of earth or stone, took the place of the water. Thus the Limes Germanicus was not complete without another line running from west to east and connecting its southern point at Loriacum with the Danube fortresses. This was the Limes Reticus, forming part of the northern boundary of the province of Retia. It is not certain whether the Flavian emperors began its construction, but it certainly did not assume its final form until the reign of Hadrian, or possibly even later. But it is so closely connected with the Limes Germanicus that it may be mentioned in this place. Beginning at Loriacum, it runs due east through Württemberg and Bavaria, and reaches the Danube near Kelheim, where the river Alcimona, Altmü, flows in. The Retian Limes is not like the Germanic, a rampart of earth. It is formed by a wall of stones, on the top of which palisades were planted, such as the soldiers used in their camps, and with the usual ditch in front. It seems probable that this line was protected by an earth wall in the time of the Flavians, but that, at a somewhat later period, when the empire was threatened by German invaders, the Devil's Wall, Teufelsmauer, as it was called in the Middle Ages, was erected. Section 3. Dacian and Suevian Wars Soon after his campaign on the Rhine, Domitian's attention was demanded by a more pressing and formidable danger on the Easter. The Dacians had invaded Moesia. The country of the Dacians was comprised between Theus and Pruth from the west to the east, the Carpathian Mountains and the Danube from north to south. Thus Dacia corresponded to the modern kingdom of Romania, along with Siebenbergen and the Banat of Temesvar. Beyond the Dacians, in the modern Moldavia and Bessarabia, were the Bastarne, a German people. Beyond them again were the Roxolani, a Sarmatian tribe. The land between the Danube and the Thais was held by the Yazigis. It was easy enough for the Romans to repel the occasional invasions of their trans-Danubian neighbors, as long as they were not united and organized under an able leader. They had been conquered more than once in the reign of Augustus, and in the last years of that emperor fifty thousand barbarians had been transported into Moesia and settled on Roman territory by Elias Catus. The same experiment had, as we have seen, been repeated under Nero, when Tiberius Plautius Elenius settled one hundred thousand Dacians with their wives and children in the same province. The same governor of Moesia checked a threatened movement of the Sarmatians before it broke out, and compelled a number of unknown or hostile princes to do obeisance before the Roman standards on Roman soil. But though Dacians and Sarmatians were thus kept in check under the Julian and Claudian emperors, the defense of the Danube was wholly insufficient a fact which became clearly apparent during the civil wars after the death of Nero. The two legions quartered in Moesia were supposed to defend the whole line from Singidunum, Belgrade, to the mouth of the river, but the defense of the lower stream was left almost altogether to the Thracians, and as the Thracians were kinsfolk of the Dacians, their help was in itself a danger. When the legions marched to Italy to overthrow Vitellius, the province was invaded by Roxolani, then by Dacians, and then by Yazigis. The opportune arrival of Mucianus with his Syrian legions repelled some of these incursions, but the governor of Moesia, Fontius Agrippa, perished in the invasion of the Yazigis. Vespasian did not actually increase the army of Illyricum, but he made some changes with a view to the defense of the Danube. He seems to have moved the two legions, which were stationed in Dalmatia, to Moesia, so that the governor of that province had four legions under his command. This reinforcement was the more necessary since Thrace had been made a province, for when the native princes of Thrace were superseded, the native army on which the defense of the Danube partly relied was dissolved. But the danger which the Roman government had especially to fear was a coalition of the Dacians with their German neighbors. A joint invasion of the empire by the Dacians and Suavians would have been very formidable. The Suavian peoples, consisting chiefly of the Marcomanni and Cadi, were still in the same seats which they had held under King Maraboduus, in the modern Bohemia and Moravia, and since his death they had been in a sort of dependent relationship to Rome. Thus they had sent auxiliaries to the army of Vespasian in the civil war with Vitellius, 
but their fidelity could not be trusted very far, and Vespasian thought it prudent to move the two Pannonian legions forward to the Danube frontier. Thirteenth Gemina was stationed at Vindobona, Vienna, and fifteenth Apollinaris, a little lower down, at Carnuntum. He also reorganized the Danube fleet, which was hence called the Flavian fleet. If things in Dacia had remained as they had been for a century past, these measures of defense might have been sufficient. But the aspect of affairs in those regions were changed by the sudden appearance of a leader of men, endowed with military genius. This was Decebalus. His conspicuous talents had attracted the attention of King Doras, who generously resigned the government in favor of one who seemed likely to regenerate his country. The idea of Decebalus, was to form a great military state which might hold its own as a power of first-rate importance on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire, somewhat as Parthia itself on the eastern. This had been attempted before by Berebistus in the time of Julius Caesar, who was making preparations for a great Dacian expedition when he was assassinated. Fortunately for Rome, Berebistus perished in a sedition about the same time, and after his death the Dacian power collapsed and fell to pieces. Meribodeus, the Marcoman, attempted to form a great German realm, as has been related in an earlier chapter, and it too collapsed. Like Meribodeus, Decebalus aimed at introducing into his country Greek and Roman civilization, and especially, in order to cope on equal terms with Rome, he set himself to learn the Roman art of war. From deserters he learned the Roman methods of entrenchment and the construction of military engines how far-reaching his designs were, and how wide his political view, may be guessed from the fact that he entered into negotiations with Parthia, the natural enemy of Rome in the east. For a Roman war, he also relied on the help of the neighboring Sarmatians, the Yaziges on one side and the Roxolani on the other, but above all on the Dacian, Getic, and Thracian population of the provinces south of the Danube. He hoped doubtless to conquer Moesia, and possibly even Thrace, and thus erect a great Dacian kingdom of homogeneous population, reaching from the Carpathians to the boundary of Asia. Dacia, at this time, was to the province south of the Danube what Britain, before the conquest, had been to the subject Celts of Gaul, a refuge and an attraction for all restless spirits. At length, when he had organized a well-disciplined army, the Dacian king descended from the Ister and dealt his first blow, 85 A.D. The legatus of Mosia, Opius Sabinus, opposed him with insufficient forces and was slain. Fortresses were seized by Decebalus and the land harried. Rome was threatened by the loss of the province. When the news of the disaster reached Rome, Domitian entrusted Cornelius Fuscus, the Praetorian prefect, with the conduct of the war, and himself repaired to the scene of the action. The Pannonian legions were summoned in haste, and the Marcomanni promised to bring aid. It seems that the Dacians had made some overtures for peace, which were rejected, and Decebalus then insolently told the Romans that he would grant them peace at the price of two asses for every soldier's head. Fuscus drove the enemy out of Moesia, and then, throwing a bridge of boats across the Danube, boldly penetrated into Dacia. But the Marcomannic confederates did not come with the succor which they had promised, and the Roman forces suffered a terrible defeat, perhaps owing to the rash confidence of their general in an unknown country. He was himself, like Sabinus, slain on the field of battle. The Romans, with difficulty, found their way back, having left in the hands of the enemy a large number of captives and booty, including war engines and an eagle of one of the legions, 86 A.D. But the next general, Julianus, avenged his predecessor. He invaded Dacia and gained a great victory at Tape. The slaughter of the barbarians was immense, and Vizinus, the chief who held second rank after Decebalus, only escaped by hiding himself among the dead. Julianus followed up his victory by marching upon Sarmizigathusa, Varheli, the chief town of Dacia. But some unknown circumstance hindered him from attacking it, probably a message from the emperor, who had in the meantime determined to make peace. According to an incredible story, however, Julian was driven back from the Dacian capital by a stratagem of the wily king. A large number of trees near the city were cut down so that the trunks were not higher than a man's stature, 
arms were attached to them, and Julian, imagining that he was opposed by an immense army, hastily retreated. What disposed Domitian to treat with the Dacians was a defeat which the Romans had experienced in another quarter. While Julian was operating in Dacia, the emperor himself had proceeded to Carnundum, and taken the field against the Marcomanni and Cadi, who had tried to play the Romans false. They sent two embassies to Domitian to excuse their conduct in failing to send help against the Dacians, but he, regarding them as rebels rather than foes, put to death the second set of ambassadors. This infuriated the Suevians, and the Pannonic army under the emperor suffered a defeat. Accordingly, when Decebalus sent an embassy to Moesia, headed by a noble Dacian named Dagus, Domitian accepted his submission and placed a diadem on the head of Dagus, as the representative of Decebalus, in token that Dacia was dependent on the empire, and Roman poets could sing that the victorious shade of Fuscus might now haunt the vassal grove in which he had been buried. On the other hand, the emperor sent to Decebalus workmen and engineers and gifts of money, which the Romans, dissatisfied with their prince, professed to regard as a shameful tribute. It was really a timely concession which involved no manner of humiliation for Rome. A tributary relation of Rome to Decebalus was out of the question after the victory of Julianus, and of all emperors the proud Domitian was least likely to assume such a humiliating position. After his return to Rome, Domitian celebrated a splendid triumph, 89 A.D. A great triumphal arc was erected near the temple of Fortuna Redux, and in the forum a colossal equestrian bronze statue of the emperor was set up. The city was filled with arches and statues in his honor. The nobility of Rome were entertained at a great banquet, and the provinces were forced to send contributions under the name of Aurum Coronarium to defray the celebrations in the city. Domitian did not officially assume the title Dasicus, though flatterers often gave it to him. An important administrative change was introduced in Moesia, as a result of the Dacian War. The province was divided into two smaller provinces, Upper and Lower Moesia, each under a legatus, with two legions at his disposal. Meanwhile, hostilities were continued with the Suevic nations and their Sarmatian allies, the Yazigis. The Romans suffered severe reverses. Not only were they defeated on their own ground in Pannonia, but a whole legion was annihilated. In May, 92 A.D., the emperor again repaired to the scene of the war and remained there eight months. Successes seem to have been gained by the Romans, for Domitian sent to the Senate dispatches wreathed in laurel, according to the practice of victorious generals, and on his return in January 93 A.D., he celebrated an ovation over the Sarmatians. This war, in which the eastern Sarmatians beyond the lower Danube were involved, as well as the Aziges, was called the Suevian and Sarmatian War, and it was protracted into the reign of Domitian's successor, Nerva. On the other hand, the peace with Dacia was preserved for ten years, and during that period Decebalus had time to mature his plans and prepare his country for a struggle with a greater adversary than either Julian or Domitian. End of chapter 22《Section Section 1 and 2 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Bunyel Beery. Chapter 23. Nerva and Trajan, and the conquest of Dacia, 96 to 117 A.D. Sections 1 and 2 Section 1. Nerva With the death of Domitian, the second imperial dynasty came to an end. But no disturbances took place like those which had followed the death of Nero. The new princeps, M. Cosseus Nerva, who acceded on October 1st, A.D. 96, was not, like Galba, set up in the provinces or chosen by the soldiers. He was the elect of the Senate. He had no claim to the Principate, either by lineage or by proeminent personal qualities. He was a clever jurist, an accomplished writer, 
and had been twice consul, but he owed his elevation to the fact that he was colorless. The senators, most of whom were doubtless privy to the conspiracy which overthrew the Flavian house, wanted an emperor who would be ready to concede a due share of government to themselves, but who at the same time would not be obnoxious to the army. Such a one they found in the inoffensive Nerva. He had never stood in the ranks of the senatorial opposition. On the contrary, he had taken part in suppressing the conspiracy of Piso, and had kept in favor with the Flavian emperors. Over sixty years of age, he was self-indulgent, tolerant, and mild, and the senate expected to find him subservient to their guidance. His reign was greeted by the aristocrats as a new epoch. Coins were issued with the inscription Libertas Publica and Roma Renascens. At length, it seemed to the most bitter adversaries of Caesarism that liberty and the principate, things formerly irreconcilable, had been happily blended. If Cato himself were restored to life, says an epigrammatist, he would be a Caesarian. It is to be observed that Nerva, like Vespasian, adopted, as a matter of course, the name Caesar, which by this time had become as necessary a part of the imperial nomenclature as Imperator itself. From Nerva the Senate obtained the guarantee which they had sought in vain from the Flavians. The new princeps took a solemn oath that he would put no member of that order to death, the Senate had good reason to be satisfied with his administration, for he consulted it on every matter. The measures taken against the instruments of Domitian's cruelty were mild, owing to the moderate character of Nerva, who would not satisfy the general outcry for revenge. The exiles, including the philosophers, were recalled, and the sufferers and their friends were eager to punish the delators who had been the cause of their wrongs. Gaius Plinius Secundus, the younger Pliny, as he is generally called, thought it a good opportunity to assail the guilty, avenge the unfortunate, and advance himself. Accordingly, he attacked Certus, one of Domitian's ministers, in the Senate. Certus had laid hands on Helvidius Priscus in the Curia, and Helvidius was a friend of Pliny. But Nerva did not permit a process to be instituted against Certus, though he went so far as to refuse him the consulship and supersede him in the praetorship. The suits which the injured were bringing against the delators were stopped at the instance of a senator named Fronto, who proposed a general act of pardon. He is said to have used words which, epigrammatically, expressed the weakness of Nerva. It is bad to have a princeps under whom no one may do anything. It is worse to have one under whom everyone may do anything. The oath of security which Nerva gave to the Senate implied the abolition of processes for maestas. Moreover, slaves were forbidden to accuse their masters of impiety or of leading a Jewish life, which seems to have been a frequent charge in the reign of Domitian. But though the Senate had condemned the memory of Domitian, Nerva did not allow all his acts to be abolished. That, for example, against mutilation was confirmed, and the marriage of uncles and nieces was forbidden, a principle acknowledged by Domitian when he refused to marry Julia. Moreover, the beneficia granted by him were confirmed. In the public finances, Nerva, like Vespasian, had difficulties to contend with. The tyranny of Domitian's later years was, as we have seen, partly due to the needs of an exhausted treasury. Nerva was obliged to suspend temporarily the celebration of games and the distributions of corn in Rome. A senatorial commission was appointed for considering the question of ways and means and the best manner of economizing. The emperor sacrificed a large amount of imperial property, the crisis was, at length, tided over. Then Nerva set himself to relieve his subjects of some of the most unpopular taxes. 
he abolished the tax which Vespasian had levied on the Jews, and which had called forth bitter discontent. He relieved Italy of the cost of supporting the imperial post, the cursus publicus, within her own borders, and transferred the burden to the fiscus. This tax was called vehiculatio, and it continued to remain in force for the provinces. He also reduced the 5% duty on inheritances. From an economical point of view, the short reign of Nerva was retrogressive. It was characterized by an exclusive and narrow attention to the interests of Italy. This was to be expected from a government which was so much under the influence of the Senate. The ideal of the Senate was to maintain the supremacy of Rome and Italy and to keep the provinces in a subordinate place, whereas one of the chief tendencies of imperial policy, the policy inaugurated by Caesar himself, was to raise the provinces to the position of importance which they had a right to claim. But Italy, perhaps, had been too much neglected by previous rulers, and it was only fair that she should have her turn now. The decline of Italian agriculture was a serious disaster which had attracted the attention of Domitian, and he had sought to remedy it by forbidding land to be drawn from the cultivation of corn inappropriated to the produce of wine. Nervous plan was to send out colonies of agriculturists, but he had not enough money at his disposal to make this remedy really effective. He bought up large lots of land and appointed a commission of senators, quatuorwiri agro dividundo, to divide it. It is important to observe that the agrarian law of Nerva was a true lex, passed at the commissia of the people. Nerva, like Claudius, revived the old republican form for the last time. More effectual and important for the welfare of Italy than his attempt to heal the irremediable agrarian evil was Nerva's system of elementary institutions, these were designed to help the education of the children of poor parents. For each town which received the benefit of this endowment, a certain sum of money was set aside at once and lent to landed proprietors, and the annual interest which it produced formed the support of the elementary institution. As the investment rested on land, it was secure, and the state on its part undertook not to withdraw the loan. The control of the administration of this charity was probably placed in the hands of men of senatorial rank, the curatores viarum. Nervous successors carried out the organization of the institution more thoroughly. The brevity of Nervous' reign gave him little time for executing public works, but he completed the forum transitorium which the mission had left unfinished, connecting the templum pacis with the forum of Augustus. This new forum was marked by the Temple of Minerva and was called the Forum of Nerva. The policy of Nerva was marked by mildness, even by weakness. He boasted that he had done no act which could prevent him from resigning the Principate, if he chose, with perfect security. His clemency, however, was the one feature which did not satisfy the senatorial party. A story is told that Moricus, who had returned from exile, was supping one evening with Nerva, and the prudent Veiento, a notorious creature of the mission, was also present, reclining in a place of honor next the emperor. The conversation chanced to turn on the blind delator Catullus, who had lately died. If he were still living, said Nerva, what would his fate be? He would be supping with us, replied Moricus, glancing at Veiento. But though Nerva was mild, perhaps because he was so mild, conspiracies were formed against him. That of Calpurnius Crassus, a descendant of the Triumvir, was easily put down, and Crassus was banished not to an island, but to the pleasant city of Tarentum. A more dangerous movement originated in the Praetorian camp. Casperius Ilianus, one of the Praetorian prefects under Domitian, and retained in the post by Nerva, excited the soldiers to demand the execution of the murderers of Domitian, especially the freedman Parthenius and the other prefect, 
Petronius Secundus, although more than a year had passed since the event. Nerva, indeed, bared his own neck, and offered to die himself instead of the victims, but he was forced to comply, about October 97 A.D. This experience decided Nerva, who was weak in health, and felt himself unable to cope with the difficulties of government or manage the soldiers, to follow the example of Augustus, Galba, and Vespasian, and chose a consort who should also be his presumptive successor. He had kinsfolk of his own, but he passed them over, and regarded the interests of the state, not those of his own family. His choice, guided by his adviser, Lucius Licinius Sura, fell on Marcus Ulpius Trajanus, the legatus of Upper Germany, and the result proved that it could not have fallen upon any one better fitted for the post. Trajan was a Spaniard of Italica, a municipium close to Hispalis in Betica. His father had served with distinction in the Jewish war, and held the proconsulate of Asia. The son, born on September 18, 52 AD, had been brought up as a soldier, and seen ten years' active service as a military tribune. He then went through the cursus honorum, and obtained the praetorship in 85 AD. We next meet him in Spain, when, on the outbreak of the revolt of Antonius Saturninus, he was ordered by the mission to lead one of the Spanish legions, first Adiutrix, of which he was clearly legatus, to Upper Germany, but the rising was suppressed before his arrival. His promptitude was rewarded by an eponymous, or ordinary consulship, in 91 AD, a great honor coming from the mission, who was usually first consul of the year himself. He was afterwards appointed legatus of Upper Germany. He was probably at Vindenissa when Nerva addressed a letter to him, offering him a share in the imperium, explaining his own difficulties, and calling upon him to take vengeance on those who had tormented him with a Homeric line. May the Dani pay for my tears beneath thy shafts. But without waiting for the consent of Trajan, Nerva proceeded without delay to perform the ceremony of adoption in his absence. The Pannonian legions had gained a victory over the Savians, who were still hostile, and to celebrate it, the citizens had assembled on the summit of the capital, in front of the temple of Jove. There, Nerva declared the adoption of his son and consort in these words, I adopt Marcus Olpius Nerva Trajanus, made prove fortunate to the Senate, the Roman people, and myself. Thus Trajan became the son of Nerva, and like Nerva himself, Caesar. It remained to confer upon him the proconsular power, and this was done in due form by a decree of the Senate. But he was not only made imperator, he also, like Titus, received the tribunician power at the same time. This probably means that the tribunician lex was proposed in the Senate at the same time, and then, after the due interval, brought before the Comitia. The elevation of Trajan to the second place in the empire took place on the 27th of October, 97 AD, and from this day Trajan dated his tribunician years. In consequence of the Pannonian victory mentioned above, both Nerva and Trajan assumed the name Germanicus. They were designated as colleagues in the consulship for the following year. Nerva died on January 27, 98 A.D. His acts were confirmed, and he was enrolled among the gods as a matter of course. And Trajan, son of the divine Nerva, was elected princeps and Augustus. Section 2. Trajan on the Rhine A new epoch in imperial history may be said to begin with the accession of Trajan. Hitherto, all the emperors had been of Roman or Italian origin. The elevation of the first Italian, the Sabine Vespasian, had been a novelty, but this was a small innovation compared with the raising of a provincial to be head of the Roman world, master of Rome herself. Not a murmur was heard at the election of Trajan, the Spaniard, though his birthplace, Italica by the Betis, was not even a colonia. How far Roman opinion had progressed during the past century in regard to the provinces 
may be estimated if we recollect that Augustus had hesitated to admit inhabitants of Transpadan Italy into the Praetorian Guards. Trajan was not required to return to Rome on his adoption by Nerva. He seems to have continued to hold the post of legatus of Upper Germany, combining it as Titus combined the Praetorian Prefecture with his imperial position. But it is probable that by virtue of his proconsular power, perhaps by the special ordinance of Nerva, he exercised beyond his own province the control over Lower Germany as well. He would thus have held a position somewhat similar to that held by Drusus, Tiberius, and Germanicus. This will explain the fact that the news of Nerva's death reached him not in the upper, but in the lower province, at Colonia Agrippinensis. The new emperor did not immediately return to Rome. He saw that there was work to be done on the Rhine, and he stayed to do it. Some time before, intestine quarrels had broken out among the Bructeri. A chieftain was expelled from their land, and had returned with the help of neighboring tribes. The governor of Lower Germany, Bastricius Perina, also assisted in the restoration of the Bructerian king, who, after his victory, settled a large number of the Chamevi and Angriverii in Bructerian territory, in order to maintain his position with their help against his own countrymen. Trajan seized the opportunity of these domestic dissensions to strengthen the fortifications of the Rhine, to complete and improve the work begun by the Flavians. Some ascribed to him the erection of the rampart and forts in the Agri Decumates, which in the foregoing chapter was described as the work of the Flavians. In any case, Trajan went on with work which was begun by them. It is certain that a road on the right bank of the Rhine, leading from Moguntiacum southward, crossing the Neisser near the present Heidelberg, and passing Aquae in the direction of Offenburg, was constructed under the auspices of Trajan in a hundred A.D. To him also Aquae, Baden, may attribute the beginning of her prosperity, as well as other towns in the same region, such as Sumelokena, Rottenburg, on the Neisser, and Lopodunum, Ladenburg. On the Minas, not far from Moguntiacum, he constructed a castellum, called after himself, but its site cannot be identified. About a mile lower than the old Vetra, he founded a new fortress, which was afterwards called Colonia Traiana. Having spent the summer of 98 A.D. in the German provinces, Trajan proceeded to the Danube, and spent the ensuing winter in making preparations for a Dacian war, which, as he foresaw, was inevitable. At this time, a road on the right bank of the Danube was made in the neighborhood of Tierna, near the present Orsova. Public interest at Rome was awakened in the operations of Trajan by the timely appearance of the Germania of Tacitus, giving a picturesque account of the manners and customs of the Teutonic peoples with which Rome had been brought in contact. Tacitus personally had some local knowledge of the subject, as he had been either legatus of a legion in Germany or governor of Belgica from 90 to 94 AD. His interest in Germany was stimulated by an instinctive perception that Rome's greatest danger lay in that quarter. The liberty of the Germans is more active than the kingdom of the Atracids. Reviewing the past history of the relations between Roman and Teuton, he makes use of that pregnant expression, tam diu Germania vincitur, so long is Germany in the process of being conquered. The Germania contains an account of the Teutons in general, and also notices of the particular tribes. The Germans have now reached a more advanced stage of civilization than that which Caesar described a hundred and twenty years before. The communities no longer migrate from one part of the territory to another, but each community of the tribe has a permanent village settlement and a certain area of arable land, although their wealth still consists chiefly in cattle and there is a considerable advance in local organization. Agriculture has become general, and each man has a fixed home. The love of hunting has declined, perhaps owing to the decrease of beasts of chase, and the warriors, during times of peace, devote themselves to the wine-bowl and to gambling. 
the arrangement which formerly held for the communities or families now held for the individual freeman each freeman receives an allotment of land from the community and his allotment is changed every year as there is a large quantity of waste land available the arable area is changed annually and nothing is grown on it but corn but though the freeman has no permanent landed property he has a permanent right to a share in the land of the community and he has complete ownership of his homestead he has also a right to a share in the common pasturage but though these facts testify to a considerable development since the days of caesar and ariovistus there are many social features which still survive they are still without cities and their buildings are very rudely put together they are still chaste they are still plain and simple in dress and they are still indifferent to merchandise differences in social rank and dignity seem to have been of three kinds one some were more wealthy that is possessed more cattle than others and those who were more wealthy must have had a larger share of pasture and arable land it is true that all the allotments of land were equal but then one man may have held more than one allotment two some were noble by race or descendants of kings or gods or great chieftains and others were not those tribes which adopted monarchy chose their kings on account of nobility this distinction of nobilis and ingenui probably involved no inequality in political rights three besides the freeborn including the nobles who possessed political rights were the freedmen and servi there were two kinds of servi a the slaves consisting of those who lost their freedom by gambling and perhaps prisoners of war and b the cultivators of the land corresponding to the roman colonni the second class was far the more important and probably consisted of the original occupiers of the land who had been subdued by the german tribe when it took possession the german colon as we may call the slave of this class possessed a home of his own and was personally free except in relation to his lord whom he could not desert and his land which like the medieval serf he could not forsake he paid to his lord a fixed quantity of corn or cattle or clothing his lot was not hard but his lord might kill him with impunity the administration of the tribe resided in the tribe or cuitas itself whether the tribe adopted monarchy or not the national assembly which met at the new or full moon wielded the power all the freeborn members of the community attended it in arms without distinction of seat in their assemblies questions of war and peace were determined the magistrates who administered justice were elected and it acted as a court of justice itself the magistrates or principes as tacitus calls them had the right of keeping a comitatus this characteristic german institution was a body of warriors attached to a chieftain who provided them with their equipment and entertained them they fought for him in war and were bound to defend him and attribute to him their own brave deeds their chief employment was war and the dignity and fame of the chieftain depended largely on the number and efficiency of his companions the principes acted independently of each other each in his district in time of peace but in war all obeyed a leader chosen by the common council royalty in those tribes where it existed was of a very limited nature and involved rather honorary privileges than political power the host or military force of the tribe consisted of both cavalry and infantry the cavalry was composed of the comitatus of the principes the infantry was of two kinds each district pagus sent a hundred chosen champions or fighting men who fought in front in battle and besides these there was the mass of the freemen who were arranged in families at the beginning of ninety nine a d trajan returned from the danube to rome where he was received with warm and unfeigned enthusiasm and became consul for the third time 
he renewed the pledge which he had already given to the senate in writing that he would not condemn a senator to death and this oath he always respected he had received from the fathers the title of pater patriae he avenged the tears of nerva by punishing the mutineers of the praetorian guard and he was so confident in his own military authority that he restored by one half the usual donative to the soldiers and no murmur was heard in handing to the praetorian prefect the dagger which was a sign of his office trajan employed the celebrated words use this for me if i do well against me if i do ill his moderate demeanor conciliated the senators and his wife platina conducted herself with the same modesty as she entered the palace she is reported to have turned to the multitude and said that she entered it with a perfect equanimity as she would wish to leave it if fate required general satisfaction was felt when trajan punished the delators whom nerva had spared some were executed others banished trajan only remained two years at rome and then proceeded to deal with the dacian question which the mission had not settled of his work in administration and legislation during those two years some account will be given in the following chapter end of chapter twenty three sections one and two sections three and four of j b beery's the student's roman empire part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Bunyel Bury, Chapter Twenty Three, Nerva and Trajan and the Conquest of Dacia, Ninety Six to One Hundred Seventeen A.D. Sections Three and Four. Section Three, First Dacian War. 101, 102 A.D. In making war against the Dacian king Decebalus, Trajan had no thought of extending the limits of the empire. Its natural border in that quarter was the Danube, just as its natural border in the east was Euphrates. His object was to prevent the consolidation of a great rival power on the Roman frontier by reducing the Dacian state to a position of dependence on Rome, somewhat like that of Armenia. Formerly, indeed, the mission had been acknowledged overlord by Decebalus when he set the diadem on the brow of Diages, but the gifts which he had consented to send to the Dacian king at certain times were too much like a tribute and seemed dishonorable to the mistress of the world. Trajan was determined to ward down the proud and teach the Dacian his place. On the 25th of March of 101 A.D., sacrifices were offered at Rome for the success of Trajan's expedition, and perhaps on that very day, certainly soon after, he set out from the city for the Danube. Besides the eight legions stated in the Illyric provinces, three in Pannonia and five in Messia, the emperor brought the 21st rapax from lower germany to take part in the war it has been supposed that the forces which he led into dacia amounted to about sixty thousand men the german and mauritanian cavalry the latter led by lucius quietus played a conspicuous part in the campaign tiberius claudius livianus the praetorian prefect and liberius maximus governor of mesia were the most prominent among the officers but Trajan directed all the operations himself. The future emperor, Hadrian, who had married Trajan's niece, Julia Sabina, was among the imperial comites. The object of the invading army was Sarmizegetusa, the chief city of Dacia. It seems probable that the Cebalus first made this place the capital, and that previously Porolissum, in the northwest of the country, held that position. The policy of Beribistus had tended rather towards the west, whereas that of the Cebalus looked southwards. It is possible that the complete occupation of Pannonia by the Romans 
may have had something to do with this shifting in Dacia. The choice of the Cebulus was a happy one. Sarmizegetusa, now called Varhili by the Hungarians, Gredistie by the Slavs, is easy to get at from other parts of the land, and at the same time easy to defend. It is connected with the northern regions of the river Marissus, Maris, by the Strigi Valley, while westward the pass of the Iron Gate leads to the valleys of a river, whose ancient name is unknown, but which is now called the Bistra, and of the Tibiscus, Thames. The plains of the lower Danube can be reached either through the Vulcan Pass or by the defile of the Red Tower. Thus, three routes were open to Trajan. 1. He might cross the Danube at Viminacian, opposite to which, on the left bank, was the Dacian fortress of Lederata. From Lederata, a road led northwards, across the Bersava, to the valley of the Tibiscus, ascended this valley, and then, turning eastward, led up the valley of its tributary to the Bistra, and so reached the Iron Gate. 2. Lower down the river, the Roman fort of Saliatis was confronted by Tierna on the Dacian bank, from which a road led past Admedium, Mehadia, to the confluence of the Thames and the Bistra. 3. A third road led from Drobete, opposite to Egeta, near the modern Turnus Severin, and preceded by the valley of the Olutus and by the pass of the Red Tower. The first of these routes was chosen by Trajan. Viminacium, Castolets, had two evident advantages as a starting point. Being equally distant from Pannonia and Mysia, it was a convenient center for gathering the troops together, and its strong fortifications made it a good base in the rear of the advancing army. It was also nearer Italy than the other possible starting points. Transport vessels were actively engaged in bringing corn, wine, vinegar, and other provisions to the place of assembling. The boats coming from Mysia had to pass through the iron gate of the Danube. Here the river, close towards Sova, is enclosed between two walls of rock rising directly from the water and of immense height. In the narrowest part, where the stream can hardly win its passage, there is an inscription of Trajan cut in the rock and recording how he made a path on the side of the steep mountain of stone. This path was for the purpose of towing the boats of provisions. At Viminacium, then a bridge of boats was thrown across the Danube for the transit of the army, and on the other side Trajan performed the due sacrifices. Their march lay by Bersovia, on the river now called Bersava, and Axis on a more northerly river. As the Romans approached the Tibiscus, an embassy arrived from the Buri, a Suevian tribe who dwelt north of the Jaziges, in the neighborhood of the Quadi. Their errand, which, it is said, was in some manner inscribed on an enormous mushroom, was to counsel the emperor to abandon his project and make peace with the Dacians. This incident can hardly be regarded as anything but a piece of insolence. The Buri fought in the army of the Cebulus. In his advance, Trajan neglected no precautions in fortifying camps and sending forward scouts. But the enemy had retreated into the recesses of the country and left the road free. At length, when the Romans reached Tape, Tapia, on the Tibiscus, a place which commands the entrance to the Bistra Valley, they found the Dacians drawn up in a strong position between the river and wooded hills. This place had been the scene of Julian's great victory thirteen years before, and it proved auspicious again to the arms of Trajan. The Romans were assisted by a thunderstorm, which threw the ranks of the enemy into disorder. In this, the first battle, the infantry on both sides seemed to have been chiefly engaged. Though the legions conquered, the victory cost them dear. It is probable that one legion, the 21st Rapax, perished almost entirely in the battle. It is related that the emperor gave his own clothes for bandages to bind up the wounds of the injured. He built an altar to the manes of those who had fallen, 
and instituted a yearly sacrifice in their memory. Not far from Tape was the town of Tibiscum, which was taken and set on fire, and then the legions advanced up the Bistra Valley. A deputation from the Sabalus, suing for peace, soon arrived. It consisted of three men on horses without saddles, followed by a number of men on foot, all of inferior rank, not belonging to the nobility, whom the Romans called Pileatai, or men of the cap. Trajan refused to listen to such envoys. The war, however, was soon suspended, owing to the approach of winter, when the invaders had only penetrated halfway up the Bistra Valley. Trajan returned to winter in Pannonia, with the greater part of his army, but left all the fortresses he had occupied strongly garrisoned. In the following spring, 102 A.D., Trajan and his legions descended by boat to Viminacium, the emperor himself rowing or steering along with the men, and retraced the road which they had traversed the year before. They found all their posts safe. Two small encounters took place now, and resulted in Roman victories, which were followed by the submission of one of the Dacian tribes. Then Trajan continued his advance on the capital. The way was difficult. The soldiers had to hew their way through forests with the axe, and they were constantly hindered by ditches and precipices. The defense of the Dacians now became more active as the enemy was approaching the heart of their country. Their belief in immortality aided their bravery and made them unsparing of their lives. They were now assisted by reinforcements of Sarmatian mounted archers, whose steeds, as well as the riders, are represented on Trajan's column as clad completely in mail. The fury of the struggle may be measured by the horrible tortures which the Dacian women inflicted on Roman prisoners by burning parts of their bodies with lighted brands. At length, the last fortress, defending the approach to Sarmis Egethusa, fell before the attack of Trajan, while his general, Liberius Maximus, at the same time captured the sister of the Sebalus in another town. Some high mountain fastnesses were also taken, and the Roman eagle was recovered, which had been lost by the mission's general, Cornelius Fuscus. After these successes, the Sebalus once more sued for peace, but this time his messengers were Pileati. Their supplication was humbler, they bent the knee to Trajan, and implored pardon. They asked him to consent to meet their king, professing that he was ready to submit to any conditions, and if he would not agree to this, at least to send deputies to the Sebalus. Licinius Sura, Trajan's friend, and Lavianus, the prefect, were sent, but the negotiations came to nothing, and the struggle was resumed. A tract of forest still separated the Romans from the Dacian capital. The Mauritanian cavalry, with Lysias Quietus at their head, attacked several detachments of the enemy and drove them into the recesses of the woods, where they barricaded themselves by trees, and their position had to be stormed like a regular fortress. The way was thus prepared for the main body of the Roman army, and on emerging on the other side of the forest, they found themselves in front of Sarmis Egethusa. The Dacians did not wait to endure the slow course of a siege. They came forth to fight, and were conquered. Then, in order to save his capital from destruction, the Sebalus submitted to whatever terms the victor deemed fitting to impose, and came himself, along with two of his chief officers, into the presence of the Roman emperor, to implore mercy. He was required to surrender all his military engines, all Roman deserters, and the workmen who had been placed at his disposal by the mission. He undertook either to destroy or to hand over to the conquerors all his fortresses. Dacia became a dependent state, and the king was bound neither to make war nor to conclude peace without the consent of Rome. Having left garrisons in some of the Dacian fortresses, and especially in Sarmis Egethusa itself, Trajan returned to Rome, accompanied by Dacian deputies, who went through the form of submitting themselves to the Senate and the peace was not regarded as finally concluded until the Senate ratified the terms which the Emperor had imposed. 
Trajan had been proclaimed Imperator three times during this war, once in the first campaign after the Battle of Tape, and twice in the second campaign. The Senate decreed him the title of Dacicus, and he was designated consul for the following year. Out of the large booty, a congiarium was distributed to the people. Section 4. Second Dacian War, 105 to 106 A.D. It soon became evident that the Sabellus did not intend to carry out the terms which his conqueror had imposed upon him. He had accepted them in order to gain a respite and make preparations for another struggle for the liberty of Dacia. But in attempting to shake off the lesser yoke of federation, he was destined only to bring upon his country the heavier yoke of direct subjection to Rome. When the emperor learned that his vassal was playing false, was receiving deserters, building and renovating fortresses, collecting the instruments of warfare, and carrying on suspicious negotiations with the neighboring tribes, he determined to overthrow the Sabellus altogether and convert Dacia into a Roman province. In taking this resolve, he departed from the recognized policy of the Roman government to abstain from extending the borders of the empire. He transgressed the precept of Augustus, as Claudius had already done in the case of Britain, he has been accused of unwisdom in taking this step, of sacrificing the interests of the empire to the ambition of military conquest. But we do not know the full circumstances of the case, and it would be rash to say that the continuance of the dependent Dacian kingdom would have been less dangerous to the empire than the creation of the Dacian province. If merely military ambition prompted Trajan in the second war, why did it not prompt him to the same policy in the first? In 104 AD, the Sabellus was decreed by the Senate to be an enemy of the Roman people, and Trajan set out for Mysia to superintend the preparations for invading Dacia in the following year. He chose a different route from that which he had followed in the former war. Instead of starting from Viminacium, he started from Egeta at which place he caused a permanent stone bridge to be built across the Danube. The architect was Apollodorus of Damascus, and bricks used in the construction of the pillars have been found, which show that soldiers of the 13th legion were employed in the work. The construction of this solid bridge, a wonderful work of engineering, was a sign of Trajan's resolve to make Dacia a province of the empire. For the second war, more troops were mustered than for the first. To the eight Illyric legions, four were added from the two German provinces. The Sabellus on his side had also made great preparations, especially in building fortresses, which seem to have played a greater part in the second than in the first war. But perhaps he did not fully believe in his own powers, ultimately, to resist the invader, for we find him while Trajan was still in Mysia, suborning two deserters to take the life of the emperor by poison. One of the traitors was arrested on suspicion, and revealed under torture the name of his accomplice. This episode casts a slur on the career of the Dacian hero. From Drobete, Trajan might follow either of two routes to reach the Dacian capital. The shortest was by the pass of Vulcan, but shortness was not Trajan's aim, otherwise he would have gone as before by Viminacium and the Bistra Valley. His object seems to have been to cut off the retreat of the enemy towards the eastern parts of Dacia, and therefore he took the other route by the Red Tower. Marching eastward from Drobete, he reached the river Alutus at Pons Alutai, but, without crossing the river, moved up the valley on the right bank. During his march, several Dacian and Josigic tribes sent messages of submission. Of the details of the march, of the points at which the Dacians offered resistance, of the length of time which elapsed before Sarmizegethusa was reached, we know nothing certain. The pass of the Red Tower was, doubtless, staunchly defended. One instance of noble self-sacrifice has been preserved. A valuable officer of Trajan, Cassius Longinus, a camp prefect, 
had somehow been enticed into the power of the Cebalus, who kept him a prisoner, and sent a message to Trajan that he would not release his captive unless Dacia were evacuated and the expenses of the war paid. The emperor, unwilling to seal the doom of Longinus, did not flatly refuse, but the prisoner freed his imperator from the dilemma by swallowing poison. The movements of the Romans were slow, but sure. At length, probably in 106 AD, they approached the capital of the Cebalus from the eastern side and laid siege to it. A battle was fought, in which the Dacians were worsted, and then the Cebalus caused his followers to set fire to their city. A number of Dacian nobles, thinking further resistance useless and not wishing to fall alive into the hands of the victor, assembled for a last banquet and drank a poisoned cup. Most of the common people submitted to the Romans. The Cebalus himself, with a few devoted followers, fled, but was followed by Roman troops, and after a combat, dispatched himself with his sword. His head was brought to Trajan and sent to Rome. His followers resisted to the last, and were not taken until the Romans set fire to the fortress in which they had shut themselves up. Trajan was saluted Imperator for the sixth time. Having arranged the organization of the new province, Trajan returned to Rome, end of 107 AD, and celebrated his triumph by a feast which lasted 123 days. Ten thousand gladiators fought in the spectacles. The people received a congiarium, and the emperor, as one who had extended the boundaries of Roman territory, extended also the pomerium of the city. The great memorial of these Dacian wars is the column of Trajan, erected by the senate in the new Forum Traiani, where it stands to this day. This column, one hundred feet high, is decorated by sculptures in low relief of scenes from both the wars. It is a picture book of the Dacian campaigns, but unluckily to most of the pictures we have no text. The Caesar who conquered Dacia, like the Caesar who conquered Gaul, wrote an account of his conquest, but the commentaries of Trajan have not survived, and this is perhaps one of the greatest losses that history has to deplore nor have we in its place any other full account of the wars, nothing but a late and meagre epitome. In these circumstances, the pillar of Trajan is of the greatest value. It is possible, from the vivid illustrations whose meaning is generally clear, to supplement in many important particulars the one very deficient written record which we possess. Just as the Bayeux tapestry helps the historian to understand the story of the Norman conquest of England, so the pillar of Trajan helps him to follow the Roman conquest of Dacia. It does not indeed throw light on the chronology and geography of the campaigns, as to which we are almost hopelessly in the dark, and it does not give a complete view of the war, for only those episodes are represented in which Trajan himself took part. Its value, perhaps, is ethnographical rather than strictly historical. It teaches us what the bearded Dacians were like, with their long hair, loose drawers, and long-sleeved jerkins. We see them fighting under their dragons, the Dacian standard. We see the Sarmatian archers on horseback, clad in complete mail. The various events of the march, as well as battle scenes and sieges, pass before us. We see the Roman soldiers following their standard-bearer across the bridge of boats at Viminacium, and the river god, the Danube, rising from his bed to behold them. Then we see the emperor performing sacrifices in front of the camp, the cutting down of trees, the construction of camps, the making of bridges, the emperor addressing the troops, are all represented. We see Dacian spies dragged by the hair into Trajan's presence, Soldiers displaying to the emperor the bloody heads of enemies they have slain, the Dacians carrying their wounded into a wood. A village built on stakes in a lake is set on fire, the women and children implore mercy. The houses of the barbarians are round with pointed roofs. 
Here is portrayed the distribution of distinctions to brave soldiers. There, the tortures which Dacian women inflict on Roman captives. In the sculptures of the Second War, we have a view of the capital city of the Cebulus, his palace, and probably the temple of Zalmoxis. We see the Dacian chiefs sitting in a circle and emptying the bowl of poison in front of the burning town. Then we see the head of the Cebulus presented to Trajan on a dish. The sculptures are ranged in a spiral band round the column, which supported a colossal statue of the Imperator. End of sections 3 and 4《セクション5や6の J.B. ビーリーズ The Student's Roman Empire Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny The Student's Roman Empire Part 2 by John Baniel Bury Chapter 23 Nerva and Trajan and the Conquest of Dacia 96 to 117 A.D. Sections 5 and 6. Section 5. Organization of Dacia. Dacia differed, in one important respect, from the other provinces of the empire. It was bounded on three sides by territory that was not Roman, and thus resembled a peninsula of civilization jutting out into a barbarian sea. The land between the Danube and the Thais was left to the Jazyges, and never formed part of the empire, so that Dacia was thus separated from Pannonia. In fact, Dacia was an eccentric position thrown out from the natural Danube frontier. It is generally thought that Trajan was guilty of a political error in occupying it, but perhaps the error rather consisted in not going further. Certainly the annexation of Jazygia seemed called for in order to complete a continuous line of frontier from the Rhine to the Pruth or Dniester. It is to be observed that the Dacian province did not extend as far east as the Pruth. It included Transylvania, the Banat, and western Wallachia. In eastern Wallachia and Moldavia there are no remains of Roman civilization, and while they were included in the Roman sphere of influence, they can hardly have belonged to the province. The remains of fortifications between the Pruth and the Dniester in modern Bessarabia have been discovered, but do not necessarily imply that the Dacian province extended so far. The native population of Dacia was exhausted by the wars, and the greater part of what remained was driven out by Trajan, probably into the eastern regions beyond the Eludus. One of the scenes on the pillar represents the fugitives going forth from their homes. A few were allowed to remain in Transylvania, but they were isolated and gradually disappeared. The land was repopulated by colonists from all parts of the Roman world, especially from Asia Minor, and thus the province of Dacia never represented a nationality. Dalmatians, skilled in mining operations, were settled in the northern districts in order to work the valuable gold mines, which were probably a considerable motive in inducing Trajan to conquer the country. They not only rendered Dacia self-supporting, but were a source of additional wealth to the fiscus. The province was placed under a legatus Augusti pro praetore. The first governor, D. Terentius Corianus, was remembered as the founder of the colony of Sarmizegethusa, under the name Ulpia Traiana. Apollum, however, further north, corresponding to the present Carlsberg, was more important than the capital of the Sibylus. It was the center of the road system of the province. Besides, these two cities, Nepica in the north and Tierna on the Danube, received Ius Italicum. It is probable that Trajan left two legions as a garrison of his new province. Both Mysia and Pannonia were guarded more strongly than ever, eight legions being distributed between them. One of the great consequences of the Dacian War was the shifting of the military center of gravity in Europe from the Rhine to the Danube. The legions which were taken from the German provinces were not sent back, except first Minervia, but were kept in the Illyric provinces. 
Here Trajan made a new administrative arrangement. As the mission had divided Mysia, so he broke up Pannonia into an upper and lower province, each under a legatus. In lower Pannonia he established a military station at Acumincum, close to the confluence of the Thies and the Danube, in order to be a check on the Jesides. In connection with Trajan's reorganization of these provinces, some new towns were founded, for example, Martianopolis, called after his sister Marciana, and Nicopolis on the Danube. Many old towns were enlarged or improved, such as Poitovio in Pannonia, Ratiaria near Widen, Serdica, Sofia, Oescus. The stations of the army of Lower Mysia were now fixed at Norway and Durostorum, Silistria. The Dobrudja district at the mouth of the Danube seems to have been excluded by Trajan from the province, though it was included in the following reign. The remains of a threefold system of ramparts of earth and stone running eastward from the Danube below Durostorum to the sea near Tomai have been discovered, and there are reasons for attributing the fortification to Trajan. One of the most distinct results of the Dacian conquest was that it stifled all thoughts of insurrection among the Thracians, whose restless spirits were no longer fomented by free kinsmen in the north. Trajan made Thrace, hitherto, a procuratorial province dependent on Mysia, a province of the first rank under a legatus augusti pro praetore. Section 6. Province of Arabia while the emperor was himself reducing the newly conquered client state of Dacia into the form of a province, the governor of Syria, Cornelius Palma, was also bringing under the direct rule of Rome the elder client state of the Nabataeans. Malchus, king of the Nabataeans, had supported Vespasian in the Jewish war, and was succeeded by his son Dabel, who was destined to be the last of the line. The change introduced doubtless for commercial reasons, by Trajan, was really administrative, but was not accomplished without resistance on the part of the Arabs, and Palma was considered a conqueror of Arabia. Some outlying regions possessed by the Nabataean king were abandoned. Damascus was annexed to the province of Syria, and the rest of the kingdom was organized as an imperial province under a legatus augusti pro praetore recommended a legion which was stationed at Bostra. The province is often called Arabia Petraia, from the important city of Petra. The country was protected by military stations. A line of fortresses protected the road from Damascus to Palmyra. Under direct Roman rule, which by its permanent military strength ensured peace, Greek civilization began to penetrate into these regions on the border of the desert. Hitherto, Hellenism, opposed by Jewish influences, had made little way here. Trajan's innovations made a new epoch. It is significant that no Greek monument dating from the time before Trajan has been found within the limits of the Nabataean kingdom, while, on the other hand, there are no inscriptions in the native tongue after Trajan. The commercial importance of Bostra, the new Bostra of Trajan, as it was called, dates from the time when it became the center of the Roman province. Its good position made it the great market for the Syrian desert, the Arabian highlands, and Persia. It became the rival of Damascus. Buildings sprang up rapidly in this land under Roman rule. New towns arose, symmetrically built, adorned with palaces and temples, theaters and baths, aqueducts and triumphal arches. The architecture owing to want of wood, developed some peculiar features, especially in the treatment of the stone arc and the dome, which give the buildings of this region a place of their own among Greek buildings of the imperial period. Another client state had ceased to exist a few years before. On the death of Agrippa II in 100 AD, the last remnant of the kingdom of Herod was annexed to the province of Syria. In consequence of this enlargement, and the subsequent addition of Damascus, Syria reached under Trajan its widest limits as a province, and, as the legatus exercised control over the secondary province of Judea, his sphere of government was a very large one. End of chapter 23, section 6